Our first speaker this morning comes from a place of deep industry experience, nearly a decade at places like Jamba and MTV, and currently she is head of studios at Wooga. She was employee, she was hire number two at Wooga, and since then they've scaled to 280 employees. And my friend Stephanie Kaiser here will be talking about the challenges of scaling. Stephanie? Thank you, Scott. Does that work? Yeah. Can you hear me well? Nodding. Okay, great. Um, three years ago, exactly today, three years ago and one day, um, I was standing on stage for Casual Connect Europe and I gave my very first public talk. Um, they had invited me, it looked a little bit like this, they had invited me to talk about virality is dead, lovable monsters think differently. Okay, so um, this was a talk about Facebook mechanisms, basically about how can you enhance virality and engagement on Facebook. So this already shows how different the time was. Let me take you back three years and let's look into our beliefs three years ago. Mm. First up, anything we did was on Facebook. So social games were basically happening on Facebook and Zing Zynga was the dominant social games developer at the time. Basically anything that ended on Vil was a big success. And just to put that a little bit more into perspective, both companies, Facebook and Zynga, were far away from going public at that point in time. So you can already see things have changed quite a bit. Um, and as well, Vuga did during this time. Um, to give you some hard facts to begin with, today, Scott already said it, we are 280 people from 40 nations. Uh, we are five years old and any game that we start today is mobile first. And 70% of our revenues come from mobile. Three years ago, this was zero. Um, most probably the only thing that hasn't changed is our location. We are still based in Berlin, and all of those 280 people are in one studio, so basically in one, uh, in one office building on three stores. The only difference is that the, well, the space grew tenfold since we started there. Um, and one more thing that might be interesting, uh, we are profitable since two years. So, all of this might sound like an easy ride. Um, I have to say, oh well. Um, there were quite some ups and downs, and I would like to talk about some of those ups and downs over the past three years. Um, but to start with, please bear in mind, this is just a snapshot. So this is Wuga 2014 that I will describe to you now. Um, and since we keep learning and uh, adapting, this will change quite soon. So it's just now and today, and it's all work in pro progress. So to start with, this talk is about scaling, so I thought I put out a picture that some of you might know. Um, scaling is like exchanging all components of a car while driving it at 100 miles per hour. So, um, I want to take you through three uh, episodes of the past three years. And the first one is about size. So, a uh, game team at Wuga. So Wuga is organized in game teams and all of those game teams are independent teams. What does that mean? Well, they all consist of one product lead who is responsible for the game itself as well as for the team. And then they all consist of artists, uh, game developers, uh, and like engineers, and game designers. And what does that mean that they are independent? Well, they have the freedom, but as well the responsibility to, to decide on their own. Um, in 2011, such a game team was five to 10 people big. In 2012, this grew to 20. And in 2013, it grew even further. Um, I can still remember that we had talks about how do we structure the company when we are at 50 people, big teams, like, or 60. We just simply fell in the same trap. We were growing as a company and all those game teams grew at the same time. And you can imagine what happens. Let me give you one example. This is the team of Fantastic Forest in 2012. That was my second game. And now you might say, well, this doesn't look like a particular big, big team to me. But I have to admit that this was the team that was working on the prototype. So, well, you can imagine that this doesn't really work well. We were trying to figure out everything at the same time. We were working on the concept, 
we were working on the art style and we were working on a code basis already, which doesn't make sense if you don't know what the core game will be about. So what happened at the time was we just simply did this mistake of having a big team on a prototype. And we were slow, we had a lot of communication going on because of course between, well, here nine people, you have to communicate a lot. While you should actually focus on just one thing, the concept of the game. And it sounds like I'm just stating the obvious, but it wasn't obvious at the time to us. We had to do this mistake to finally get to the point where we are today, where just one or two people start a game. And what they basically do is what you should do when you start a game. You look into tons of concepts, you create them, you get tons of feedback, and then you prototype the hell out of it, right? Um, so this is how we changed, but we had to make this mistake first. All right, and not only in prototyping stage, but as well as la at later stages, we are trying to keep our teams as small as possible. It depends a bit on the type of game, but we try to have between, well, five to 15, I would say. All right, so this, that much about size. The second episode is about communication. As I said before, um, we have independent game teams, so you can imagine them as mini Wugas. Um, they work independently in a collaborative way together, but they have their own mini CEO, basically, the product lead. And everybody can do the math. If you, have, um, if you are growing to 280 people, but at the same time, you try to keep those teams small, well, you just end up with tons of teams. <laughs> and basically, at the moment, it's around 20 game teams. And the biggest challenge is it has a lot of advantages, like this uh, structure of having uh, independent teams, but it has one disadvantage, and that's economies of scale when it comes to information sharing and learning together. So basically, um, team A, imagine, team A learns something, and then team B learns exactly the same thing just two weeks later. That doesn't really scale well, right? So. And that's what happened. We had this problem. So basically, um, communication and transparency became a bigger and bigger challenge the bigger we grew and the more teams we had. So now I will show you four things, just four, that we are doing today to enhance this. There are tons of more things we are doing um, in on this topic. I can, like afterwards, you can ask me questions. Um, so the first thing is our Manda Monday morning stand up. It's, it happens every Monday at 9.30. And it's mandatory, so everybody from the company has to join. We built an auditorium for that in our office, and um, all of those 280 people should be there. Not everyone is. Um, and it's around 15 minutes, so really not long, because, uh, well, you don't want to take away 280 people from their work. But uh, it always talks about, well, different topics. It can be game updates, it can be HR updates, it could be something around company strategy. It's among five to, seven, uh, five to six topics per week. <coughs> and, well, it's basically sharing what everybody at the company needs to know. The second thing that we do is a weekly meeting um, that where everyone at nine, well, it's all different game teams and every morning at 9.30 and every evening at six, different game teams are talking about what they have learned in the last week. So it's a weekly meeting and um, it's not mandatory, so everybody can come, but they don't have to. And that's basically where you learn what team A learned, basically. So team A learned this, and you learn it at the same time. That's the goal of this weekly meeting. The third thing we are doing is the so-called five minutes of fame. It's a monthly meeting. It is for, it's going on for one hour, and it's across uh, functions, basically. So we have a five minutes of fame for product people, and a five minutes of fame for backenders and for analysts. Etc. Etc. You name it, um, and again, it's not mandatory, but you can go there if you want to learn what they have learned. And basically, anyone let's let's take a product uh, five minutes of fame. Anyone from the product managers or game designers can have their very own five minutes of fame and talk about something that they have learned about in the past months or whatever, just to share the learnings across all Wugas. And then one more thing we did to enhance transparency is a very new format for us. It's an ask me anything quest, uh, questions um, hour, where Jens is basically answering every question of, well, not everyone, uh, every question, but um, many questions of the employees. The way we do it is that we have a website 
where people can submit their questions and then everyone from the company can write those questions. And then Jens uh, subsequently will do a, a brown bag, which is a lunch session of 45 uh, minutes roundabout, where everybody can come. And um, then he would just go through all those questions uh, according to their ranking, and then he answers those questions. So that's four tools. Oh, by the way, this we have just done once. That's why I'm saying it's just work in progress. We have done it once, and um, we got a lot of good feedback, and there is a second session now, um, now scheduled, but I want to say we're not doing this since forever. It's, it's we are learning all the time. So that much about communication. Um, while we were busy, basically, growing and um, changing the size and setup of our teams and enhancing communication, as well as building Facebook games, just one tiny little thing happened. And that was the industry turned upside down. So WUGA started five years ago with building Facebook games. And all of a sudden, mobile was the talk of the town. And um, in, uh, three years ago, Basically, we didn't have any mobile game in development. So my third episode is about mindset and how we had to change our mindset. As I said, three years ago, we didn't even have, like we had no mobile game in development. We had one idea of building a mobile game in HTML5, which we did, and that was quite a mistake. <laughs> so that did not work well. And then in that year as well, we started to, uh, to work on our first iOS game. And not only the platform changed, but as well the way of distribution and as well the competition changed quite tremendously ever since. So there are many, many apps per week new uh, on the App Store. And you can imagine, you really have to have a hit to get to the top charts. And there, are, there is no such thing anymore as a medium successful game. A fast follower doesn't just doesn't cut it anymore. It needs to be a hit. So the, the whole industry turned more hit-driven. And for that, we needed to ask ourselves much more often, um, is this, this game that we are currently working on, is this going to be the next hit or not? And if not, we had to cut it. But why did we have to change our mindset in the first place? Well, in the first four years of Wuga, we have stopped one single game in production. And it was a huge catastrophe because it, we were just not used to it. We just didn't do it before. So it felt like the biggest failure on earth for us. I still remember this all hands meeting where we were talking about it. So that we are stopping this, it was called Dream Cruise, that we are stopping this game. We were just not used to it. And quite frankly, we were simply afraid of failure. And because of that, we didn't have, we didn't have a development process in place where we were constantly asking ourselves, um, is this going to be the next hit? We just didn't have that and we were not used to asking those questions and stopping projects. Um, but as I said, I mean, as a result, we were working on a bunch of good games, but good just doesn't cut it anymore. And that was a big mistake at the time. So what did we change? Well, we started to um, change our development process so we could select wisely which game are we working on. Today, we have several concept, uh, several stages uh, of um, game development in place. And at each of those stages, we are asking ourselves, is this going to be the next hit? And as well in between. We do that in gate meetings and review meetings, where basically uh, several people come together and um, we have all the feedback on, on user, user tests and feedback from the company on the games. And then we question really hard. And if we are not sure if something is going to be a hit, then we just stop it, just. And just one more thing to say about this, it's not the reviewer committee that is deciding this. It's actually the mini CEO of their own games. So I said it before, we have product leads per game, and they are the ones who decide whether a game should continue or not. So And then after stopping, so as a result, we have stopped in the past months around 10 games in several development stages. It could be during prototyping, but as well uh, after soft launch. And it was not a catastrophe anymore, because now I couldn't say we are used to it, but it gets more normal. Mm. The ultimate goal of all of this is that we want to make sure everybody works on projects that matter, everybody in all game teams. 
and that could potentially be the next hit. So to sum that up, in the past three years we have changed the size and setup of our uh, teams, the way we communicate with each other, as well as um, our mindset on how we create games. So to come back to this, um, exchanging all components of a car while driving it at 100 miles per hour might sound quite scary and adventurous, but actually it's, it's, a, it's, it's quite an exciting ride. And if you <coughs> fell asleep because it's early in the morning, you should remember one thing from this talk. Um, don't be afraid of changing, basically. Because the industry will change, that's for sure, and your company might change, and you might or might not grow like crazy. Um, but don't be afraid to fail quickly, you will, and then acknowledge it quickly and change as fast as possible. Um, I can only say for myself, it was quite an exciting ride for the past five years, and I'm sure it will be going forward. Thank you. So, uh, excellent talk, Stephanie. Makes me really want to quit everything I'm doing and apply to WUGA. So, when I apply to WUGA, uh, going from two people to 280 um, so quickly and preserving the culture uh, that is WUGA um, must be a tremendous challenge. So, if you could put that culture into one or two sentences and then tell us how you preserve the culture, like how how you can quickly see if people have that WUGA culture in them during the interview process. This is not working, this is working. Who, in one or two sentences, WUGA culture. Oh my God, that's quite a, that's, that's, uh, that's a task. It's only 10.30 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, when I start about culture of WUGA, I always, it goes on and on forever, but, um, well, it's basically, we cannot say it's a startup anymore, so it's a we, one has to admit it's a big company. But I think at the core of our culture we have those small game teams and um, those independent teams. That's very, very um, important for us. So it's not Jens, the CEO, deciding about games. It is the product lead of each game team. And those independent teams, as I said, they have the freedom, but as well the responsibility to, d to uh, decide and to, well, make their own fail um, uh, mistakes, but then learn as quickly as possible. So as I said, we try to keep those teams as small as possible, as agile as possible, and then it's all about communication and transparency in a sense that we want everybody to be able to make informed decisions. So for example, something I didn't talk about is we have a website, it's called reporting.wuga.com, you can go to it, you will not get access, but everybody at WUGA has access. And you can get all the numbers that you need to make an informed decision because we are very analytics driven. Usually I'm, I'm giving product talks. <laughs> um, so I think that's the two things that is really, uh, really important. And how do we find this out in the hiring process? Whew. Well, it, our hiring processes are quite um, um, difficult, I think. Uh, so there are always several interviewers and um, when we hire product people, we like to give them tests as well. Um, that they, um, well, they have a task, what would be the next mobile hit, and then they present it to us, and then uh, we have several people talking to them and, um, well, basically asking questions around culture as well, um, just to find out if this fits. Does that answer your question a bit? It's, it's an excellent answer, especially for this early. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry to uh, put you under the hammer like that. So, audience, who wants a piece of Stephanie? Okay. Hello, uh, small question. Uh, you were speaking about the teams you had. I was wondering if uh, sales and marketing is included in these teams? No, it's not. So marketing is a, is a horizontal, um, uh, cross-functional department. So, so the teams are only development focused? Yes, exactly. Thanks. Hi, um, how do you find that uh, you describe the process where various projects are actually starting and uh, many of them are get, get cut, so you got, can crop and leave only the best ones, right? How do you find that it affects emotionally the people that work for WOGA, this cycle that will happen to almost everybody, right? That, that it will be cut. How do you find that they react to that? 
and I can only talk about my own experience as well because I had to cut several of my games. <laughs> and um, well, I, it, to me, it feels like you have a period where you are just sad, and you have to accept it. It's um, because it's your baby. You're cutting your own baby, and it's um, it is. Well, you know, after after the first time, you will know that it goes away as well. <laughs> so you're sad for a certain time, and then it's so fine again. The, the circles of grief, right? Exactly. You, you yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> okay, it's, so. it's exactly that. And if you know that, it's it's just fine. You know, you yeah, just yeah. have to deal with it. And I guess you create a culture that accepts failure, so it, 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 because else it wouldn't work, right? It would just uh, blow away. Exactly. Yeah. And I think um, something we are not doing right. We are still in this notion of when we c stop a game, people. Some people still say sorry. And one of my product leads just approached me last week and, and told me that one person had said congratulations. And that is, I think, quite good yeah. because, I mean, of course you need to cut games that are not going to be successful. So I think a congratulations in that moment is quite good as well. And of course, I mean, it's, it's difficult for people uh, at the same time because when you dissolve teams uh, so often, then some people just don't have a job right immediately. And um, I think that that was quite a challenge as well that I was uh, not including in the talk because I wanted to keep it brief. But um, it is kind of a moving company where a lot of people are moving from team to team all the time. And um, I think you have to create a culture where people are sure that they are not going to be cut. Like there, there will always be something for them. And I think that's, like, that's what we are currently working on. Any other question? Oh yeah, there. Oh, there was one. Thank I won't you. Forget you. Uh, the question is: How many games uh, Vuga develops, and how many they publishes within one year? How so many we you publish? See how many? What the percentage of those games which are get cut? Ah, all right. Who? I don't know the exact numbers. Does somebody of you know? Ha! Greg knows that. All right, I'm on stage all of a sudden. Um, about 60 prototypes a year, and um, out of those prototypes, we aim to release between two and three um, full launch with marketing support. Yeah. So, there was one, one last question. question. There. Hi, uh, I'm just curious, what are the key KPIs that you look at when you're trying to make the decision of whether to cut a game or to move forward with production? Retention. One day retention, three day retention. I think Supercell is talking about 300, reten 300 day retention. That's quite difficult in the soft launch, but yeah, it's all about retention. Retention, oh. retention, retention. Get them back for play two, day two, week two, they're going to pay you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That was awesome.